Songs will be singing will be pleasing to you this morning, and we will leave here with our hearts uh, directed towards you. We ask all these things through Son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. to be with you here this morning, and I hope that you guys are excited too. Um, so over the next uh, couple of months, we're going to uh, be studying the book of Ruth. Um, I, I love the book of Ruth. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible, and I hope that you guys are excited about that. If you're not excited about Ruth now, I'm going to make it my mission that you'll be excited about Ruth by the end. Um, it, it's an awesome book. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to give you all a chance to get to know me. Some of you might be thinking, who's this guy coming over from Faith Baptist? Why should we want to listen to him? Um, well, you probably shouldn't. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to preach a sermon, a, a very similar sermon to one that I preached seven years ago um, when I came to faith um, as a candidate. Um, and so it has, has two goals. So the, there's the goal. The first goal is for you to just get to know a little bit about me. But the second, more important goal is, is to point us all to Christ and to fix our eyes on him and not the us. Um, so as, as we are preparing to dive into Galatians, let me just remind you um, a little bit about the context of this book. So Paul has written this book of Galatians um, in response to false teaching that has arisen in Galatia. And the false teaching was being um, taught by these this group called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were people of Jewish descent who had become intellectually convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. So they, they saw Jesus for who he was. He was the Messiah. But they were unwilling to fully buy into Christianity. They still held on to the Jewish rituals and, and traditions. And so they were going around saying, that in order to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus, but also follow the law. And specifically to the church in Galatia, they're trying to push the ritual of circumcision 
onto the Gentile believers. So this, this idea of circumcision that we're going to read about, it, it's kind of summing up all Jewish religions or rituals. So it wasn't just about that. It was It's the spirit of you must follow all of these rituals. But circumcision is the one that they chose uh, to emphasize. And, and so Paul is writing this letter to the church of Galatia to refute that heresy. So follow along with me as I read once again um, this passage from Galatians chapter 6, um, verses 12 through 15. Those who want to impress people by, and I'm reading from the NIV this time. We read the ESV earlier, but this one's NIV. Um, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is new creation. Let's pray. Father, we come before you so thankful that you have revealed yourself to us through your word. And I just pray that you will speak through me um, as, as we dive into this text, Lord, um, that, that we will know to focus on you and only you, that we will rejoice in you and only you, and that we will have our lives fixed on you, to follow you in your leading. Yes, all these things are so just Amen. All right, so I, I've titled this... Um, this sermon, The Charter of Christian Liberty. And I stole that title from a book that I have in my office at, at Faith um, about Galatians. It was written by Merrill, Merrill Tenney, if anyone knows who that is. Um, but the theme of this book of Galatians is the theme for this morning. It's the Charter of Christian Liberty. W what does it mean to have Christian liberty? That the whole book of Galatians is rejoicing in the fact that we are not in bondage to sin anymore. You know, I love Galatians. In, in um, Galatians 5.1, the Apostle Paul makes one of the great well-duh statements in the whole Bible. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Well, of course, we have been set free to be free. Duh. But, but Paul's point here is that we should not allow ourselves to be put under the yoke of bondage once again now that we have been set free. And, and, and that's, that's the whole theme of this book. And so we're, we're going to go through our, our text this morning, verse by verse, starting with verses 12 and 13, where, where we see that Paul's talking about no other gospel. And so Paul here is describing the mindset of the Judaizers. And so the first thing that we learn about them is that they want to impress people. They, they are trying to get the Galatians to be circumcised, to follow the Jewish rituals so that they can boast about it. They can go back and say, look, at, we convinced them to do this. They are doing this because of us. They're not doing it to save anyone's soul. They're not doing it to bring glory to God. They're doing it so that they will receive glory themselves. That they want people to think good about them. And, and wanting people to think good about you isn't a bad thing. Like, we all want people to like us, right? Like I'm, I'm standing here hoping that you guys like me. Um, if you don't, just don't tell me. Um, but but these, these people, their primary motivation is to impress people. That They're not out there preaching because they want to save souls and bring glory to God. They're out there to impress people so they can puff themselves up they aren't following the lord they're not doing it out of service to god they're attempting to earn their good reputation and they're also doing it to avoid persecution <laughs> now there, there's two groups that they could want to avoid persecution from they don't want to be persecuted by rome because at this time christianity is not an approved religion in rome and so 
by saying, hey, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but also we follow the Jewish law. They might be able to skirt persecution from Rome because they would look at it as the same as the Jews. But more likely, who Paul is specifically referring to is persecution from the Jewish leaders. The synagogue was the central place for Jews. It's, it's where all of life happened. And so to be cast out of the synagogue was a huge thing for these early Jewish believers. And so they're trying to appease the Jewish leaders who are saying, you have to do this. You have to follow the law. You have to be circumcised. And if these Judaizers were fellowshipping with Gentiles who are not circumcised, they run the risk of persecution. And so they want their good reputation. They want to be well thought of. They want to be able to brag about all the things that they've done. And they also don't want to be persecuted. They don't want to be cast out of the synagogue. They want to continue to live their lives as they have. And so Paul says they're, they're, they don't keep the law themselves. Paul recognizes this, and he says they know themselves that they're not keeping all of the law, that they are falling short. But yet they're trying to bring that same yoke of bondage onto these Gentile believers. Because, you know, misery loves company. And rather than rejoicing in the freedom that these Gentile Christians have, they're trying to throw this, this bondage over top of them. They can't keep the law, so they're trying to make the Gentiles keep the law, so then they can say, hey, look what we did. And, and we don't have a fancy name like Judaizers for people like this today. But we have people like this today. We have to be so very careful about adding things to the gospel. We, we live in an extremely polarizing time right now. And I have seen people on both sides of just about every issue question the faith of people on the other side. All right? I have heard people question the sincerity of people's faith who refuse to wear a mask. And I have people or heard people question the sincerity of someone's faith who continues to wear a mask. This is absurd. I have heard people say you can't be a Christian and vote for a Democrat. And I have heard people say you can't be a Christian and vote for a Republican. We cannot add to the gospel. Pick an issue, just about any issue out there. And there are good Christians on both sides. If we look around this room, just briefly, we can't find two people who agree on everything. Like, even my wife and I don't agree on everything. We agree on sometimes very little. I'm usually wrong. Uh, but but the, the letter to the Galatians is a warning about putting too much weight on things that are non-gospel issues. We are called to be unified. We are called to be one body. We are one family. And I'm so excited to be here today because I've lived in Sheboygan for seven years. And this is the first time that I've been inside a different church on a Sunday morning other than faith. And it's a wonderful thing to get to fellowship with other believers. Because even though this is a body and the body of faith is one body and the other churches in Sheboygan are one body, we are still all one body in Christ. And it's well past time that we stop focusing on the things that divide us and start rejoicing in the one thing that unites us. We need to hold fast 
to the gospel, to the essentials, and we need to add nothing to it. And that's where we, what we find in Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. The apostle writes, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. If even an angel came in here today and preached a gospel other than what we have received, let them be under God's curse. It is pure foolishness and arrogance to think that we are exempt from that same treatment. We must add nothing to the gospel of Christ. So then Paul continues in Galatians 4 or 6:14. Where he talks about boasting in the cross. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so Paul moves away from the mindset of the Judaizers and talks about his own mindset. Paul says he wishes to never boast in anything except the cross of Christ. And I love this phrase, may I never. So the King James, I think they still have their King James Bible today. Probably not. Um, but the King James says, God forbid. That's, that's how it translates this phrase. God forbid that I do this. Paul, it, it's kind of like a prayer that Paul is saying, God prevent me from ever doing this thing. And that, that shows the strength of what Paul is saying here. Paul does not want to boast, to rejoice in, or to take glory in anything except for the cross of Christ. I want to sit here for a few minutes um, just before, before we move on and just talk about who Paul is. Because if there is anyone in human history who could boast about their credentials, it's the Apostle Paul. Paul is probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. And so Paul saying this shoots anyone else's chance of saying, you know what, I was good enough to do this. Turn, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, where Paul, Paul lays out his resume here. And this is an impressive resume. So this is Philippians 3, um, chapter, or verses 3 through 6. Paul says, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else think they have, thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul is saying that if there is anyone out there who is confident that their resume can get them to heaven, it pales in comparison to his resume. Paul outshines them all. Circumcised on the eighth day according to the law of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. His ancestry, his lineage is flawless. As far as his knowledge of the law, a Pharisee. An elite intellectual. As for zeal, his dedication to the law, he persecuted the church. He persecuted those who would depart from tradition. As for righteousness gained according to the law of God, faultless. That's his resume. But he continues. Now that he knows Christ, he says, picking up in verse 7, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. He casts all of that aside. 
as good as he was, he has come to realize that that is rubbish, garbage, filthy rags, to use Isaiah's language. And this is something that we all need to come to understand. Now, I, I relate a lot to Paul, um, because not, not that I was ever Paul, who, like I said, is probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. But there are aspects of my of Paul's life that hit home. Now, my, my resume is not Paul's resume, but in an American Christian smaller way, it's it's similar. I've, I've been in church my entire life. Now, it's, it was always really difficult for me to to share my testimony, not because I overcame anything difficult, not because uh, it was impressive or anything, but be simply because I can't point to a day and say, right then, that's when my life changed. Because I was in church my whole life. My father was and still is a deacon in the same church that I grew up in. My mom was my Sunday school teacher and still teaches Sunday school. My grandfather was the Sunday school superintendent. My grandmother taught Sunday school and played the organ. When the doors of that church were open, I was there, and it didn't matter what it was for. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was the oldest male student in our youth group. And so for three years, I had youth leaders pouring into my life, trying to turn me into the leader of that youth group. And not just on Sundays, like they, they would take me out for lunch all throughout the week. It was that, like that was my life. I was being groomed to be this, this great teenage leader of this youth group. As a senior in high school, we took a trip to Liberty University, and I committed my life to full-time ministry. I told God I would go where he would want me, to, want me to go, and I would do what he wanted me to do. And then I ended up attending Liberty University um, with the intention of becoming a youth pastor. I majored in biblical studies. I, 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 can, I can keep going. During college, I interned at a mega church near Washington, D.C. for the summer. And then I went back home and interned at the church that I grew up in. Um, while I was at college, I led a youth group where I met my wife, um, and I taught Sunday school to the youth group, and, and I led their youth group events and, and talked, you know, two or three times a week from the Bible. And, and, and so all of those things are on my resume. After we got married, um, I was working for Liberty in the IT department, and you know we're, we're poor college students, barely making above minimum wage, both of us. And I was up for a promotion um, that would have given me more money than what I knew what to do with, although looking back, it wasn't that much money at all. Um, but, for, but for poor college students, it, was a, it looked real attractive. Um, and um, you know, we, we could have had a very comfortable life. But instead of doing that, we said, you know what, let's step away. We moved back to Michigan. We, we stepped out in faith. Um, and then six months later, here we are in joy. And, and, and so we, I, I believe that I'm here today because throughout the last seven years of service here in Sheboygan, I've got a reputation of service to our great God. Like, and I could rejoice in that. I, I could be happy about that. And, and part of me is happy about that. But if that's all I was putting my faith in, like if that's all it was, it's nothing. None, none of that truly matters. And, and part of the reason that none of that truly matters is because I left out some really important details. Like the fact that when I was in middle school, I was really embarrassed that I went to church. And I tried to hide it from my friends. And then when I was in high school, despite the fact that I had these youth leaders pouring into my life, I did not live the way I should have lived. I was one kid at church and a completely different kid at school. And it wasn't until I realized that all of the things that I was doing, going through all of these motions, having my family's faith surrounding me wasn't going to save me, that things changed. 
It wasn't until I surrendered to the leading of the Holy Spirit that my life truly changed. And I stopped putting confidence in the things that I did and instead put confidence in what Christ has done for me. It was then that I found peace and comfort. And that's what Paul is telling us. May I never boast. May I never rejoice in anything. May I never take glory in anything except the cross of Christ. Now this is an incredibly countercultural thing to say for Paul. Because we, we, we don't understand what this really means. Because we have crosses everywhere. We have crosses right here. We have crosses on pendants. Or we, we, we've got crosses all over the place. But back then, the cross was a symbol of torture and pain and condemnation. It was such a big deal that people didn't even say cross or someone was crucified. They would use a euphemism like you were lifted up or you had your hands stretched out because it was such a violent, horrific thing. And yet Paul here is saying, I'm going to boast in nothing except the cross of Christ. Because when Jesus went to that cross, what was usually a symbol of condemnation turned into a symbol of love and mercy and forgiveness. Paul recognizes that Christ has flipped the cross on its head. God poured out his love and forgiveness through the cross, and that's all that mattered. And, and Paul could have ended, ended there. He could have said that he will only boast in the cross of Christ. That would have been a sufficient statement to make. But then he says something really important. He says, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world has been crucified to me. The world is dead to me. When we are focused on the cross, we rejoice in nothing else. We value nothing else. The things of the world are dead. They don't matter anymore. When all that matters is Christ, the world is worthless. We won't value the things the world values. We won't believe the things the world tells us. All of these things that the world has to offer will look like rubbish. And it is only when the world is dead to us and we are dead to the world that we will be able to focus on Christ, solely on Christ. The, the, the world's not going to take us seriously anymore, right? If, if, if the things of the world are dead to us, we are dead to the world. We look foolish. We look like we're crazy. Why don't we value all of these things? Why don't we value money? Why don't we chase success above all else? Because that's what the world is all about, right? We are dead to the world. It, it, the, the world will continue to neglect and belittle those who focus solely on Christ. And if you need convincing, just look at what happened to Paul or any of the other apostles. Or a, even a quick overview of church history will show that this is the case. We are dead to the world, and the world is dead to us. But then we keep moving to the last verse, verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is new creation. What Paul is telling the Galatians is that the Jewish rituals are of no value, that they mean nothing. When the cross is the center of your life, if you are gospel-focused, none of the other stuff matters because you are a new creation. When we are found in Christ, we aren't the same people we once were. We are made new. Christ has done something in your life that was not there before. The most common verse regarding this topic is 2 Corinthians um, 5, uh, verse 17. that says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. 
I just love that. The old is gone, the new is here. And I, I, the reason I love that so much is because everyone is new. Everyone gets a blank state, slate. All of my accomplishments, the resume that I laid out before you is gone. It doesn't matter because I am new in Christ. Anything that I might be tempted to brag about, anything I might be tempted to put my confidence in, it's gone. It doesn't matter because I am new in Christ Jesus. But you know what else? The opposite is true too. If you, listening to me tell the story of my life really quickly, if, if that was a completely foreign life for you, maybe you didn't even hear the gospel until you were an adult and had a lifetime of sin and, and regret behind you. Maybe sometimes you feel so embarrassed, so guilty. You, you have this weight weighing you down, holding you down because you feel like God would never forgive you. Because you feel like you don't deserve forgiveness. Maybe you're embarrassed. You think that some of the things you've done are unforgivable. But this tells us that we are new. The old is gone. It doesn't matter what is in your past, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's all gone. And we are all new. We are all on equal footing. The self-righteousness of your past is revealed for what it was worthless trash and the sin and regret is gone too new creation is all that matters and as I close this morning I want to just encourage you for a few minutes first if you relate to Paul and, and, and to me you have this very long list of accomplishments of good works those are your quotes good works um, let me remind you that those are of no value. It, it, it doesn't matter how many times you were in church this past year. I mean, we love it when we're in church. It's a great thing. But it's not going to save you. It doesn't matter how much money you give. It doesn't matter any of the good things that you do if you are not focused on Christ. They, they mean nothing apart from faith in Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for my family and the upbringing that I had. Um, for, especially for my parents who modeled for me what it means to be a good Christian. They, they are truly remarkable people. But if that's what you are putting your confidence in, it is worthless. Don't put your confidence in anything but the cross of Christ. It can be so tempting for us to become prideful. And, and arrogant and to think that we can do it on our own. So I urge you to reject that and to focus solely on the cross of Christ. The cross is the antidote for all of these things. Because if the cross is what it took to forgive us from our sins, how bad must they have been? If it took that great of a price. Never stop rejoicing in the fact that you are a sinner saved by grace. And the cross should center us. It should humble us. And it should remind us that we are nothing apart from grace. And if you're on the other side, if you feel shame, if you feel the weight of your sin, if you feel broken and ready to give up, I would urge you to fix your eyes upon the cross. For it is the cross where the love of God is displayed most clearly. That God would send his son, that he himself would become man, Jesus, that he would live on this earth for three decades, enduring pain and suffering, this, the same pain and suffering that each of us endures in our daily lives, and then some. And that he would willingly 
suffer and die the most humiliating and painful death the world could come up with. That he would endure the punishment for all sin for all time. If God would do that, if he would offer us this precious gift, how can we think that he would withhold anything else from us? He gave us the most valuable thing in the universe. Anything else is near trinkets. There is no sin, no life lived that God cannot redeem. Focus on the cross of Christ. That is all there is to do. Put your hope, put your faith in Christ Jesus and trust him and him alone. And finally, allow me to bring this back full circle to the title of this sermon. The Charter of Christian Liberty. That's what the book of Galatians is. And I hope that I've demonstrated what this should look like through this sermon. Christian liberty is the freedom from the bondage of sin and death. It is being able to live in this world without being caught up in it. It is about accepting the fact that there is nothing you can do to earn your salvation in putting your hope in Christ. It's about ignoring all of the other voices, whether it's the world shouting at you, telling you what you have to do, what you have to believe, or whether it's that quiet whisper in your own head telling you that you're not good enough. Christian liberty is the freedom that comes from knowing that Christ is our Savior, our Lord, and our Master. It is joyfully serving Him, not out of fear, not out of obligation, but out of adoration for the one who loved us and laid his down, or laid his life down for us. So don't get caught up in the things of the world. Don't overreact to the times. Don't find yourself drifting from one extreme to the other. Fix your eyes on the cross. Rejoice in Christ, for he is our salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we, we come before you just so humbled by the fact that you love us so much that you would give us your son, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will continue to be with us, that you will help us to, to follow you just with unwavering perseverance, Lord. That, that we will strive after you day after day after day. That we will not become distracted, that we will not be led astray by the things of the world, Lord, but that we will, with a single-minded focus, seek after you, Lord. We ask all these things in your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right. As we uh, transition to um, the Lord's Supper, I would encourage you, if you haven't gotten one of the, the communion uh, cups to go ahead and grab one. I think that John has some in the back for anyone. Um, and also um, turn with me in your Bible to, to Jeremiah 31. Um, it, it, it is a privilege um, to be able to, to share um, the Lord's Supper with you. I, I, it's one of my favorite things that we do as a church that we, we come together and we celebrate this, this meal together. And the way we do it is not really much of a meal. Um, but, it, but the, the symbolism is still there, this, this idea of, of fellowship as, as we all come together and, and we consider and we rejoice in the sacrifice of Christ, the blessings that we have through him, um, and as, as we look forward to his return. It, it's a wonderful thing that the church is able to do. Um, so so as, we, as we prepare ourselves for this, allow me to read... Um, from Jeremiah uh, chapter 31. I didn't tell you what chapter, I don't think, did I? Yeah, I did. 31, starting in verse uh, 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is the promise. This is the covenant that was bought with the blood of Christ. This is the new and better covenant. Jesus died on the cross to usher this in. And, and we rejoice in that fact. And when we know that the bread and the juice that we are about to partake in does not save us. It doesn't impart any special grace to us, but it is a remembrance and a celebration of what Christ did for us. And it is, it's a wonderful thing. And, and it's also a, a serious thing that we should consider. Paul warns, the, the, the Apostle Paul warns those who would participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. It, it, it's a very stern thing. It's a very serious thing. It's something that we should take seriously. And, and so parents, we leave it up to your discretion about whether or not um, you should let your children participate. Um, but if you have any doubts, I would encourage you to talk to the, the leaders of your church um, so that you can be on the same page and, and understand what this meal means and represents as we partake together. Um, so we're just going to take a few minutes um, to, to examine our hearts um, and, and prepare ourselves uh, to take um, the Lord's Supper together. <coughs> Father God, we, we come before you again, just so thankful for, for your love, for your grace that you poured out upon us, Lord. And as, as we prepare to, to take this, uh, this supper together, Lord, I pray that you will, you will remind us of your sacrifice, Lord, that we will, that we will celebrate um, the love that you have for us, the grace that you poured out on us on that cross, Lord. But the, we will also remember that you are coming back again. And that one day we will all, all Christians for all time, will, will share in this meal together with you in glory. Lord, we look forward to that day. Lord, I pray that you will be with us, um, that, that we will confess our sins, and that we will strive to live a life of obedience to you. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and uh, peel off just the top one to, to get to the bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When we had given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this. We can open up the juice. Paul continues, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Father God, again, we come before you. Just so grateful, so thank you. We're thankful for all that you've done. Lord, we rejoice in your love. We rejoice in your grace. And, and we have our eyes fixed on you, eagerly awaiting your return. Because all these things are so just <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Can we please stand as we sing our composing song? <clears throat> Thank you. 